Hi, I'm Drew, application engineer with Megger. Today we'll be covering the overview of the AWA, all the hardware, including the operation. So I think we'll start off by turning the unit on. Um, on the right side over here, we have an on-off switch. Simply toggle that to the on position and the unit will boot up. Now the AWA is equipped with the uh, Windows operating system. So you'll see the starting Windows logo as it boots up. And then we'll be prompted here for a login password and your username is just administrator and then the password by default is Baker, all lowercase, B-A-K-E-R. <clears throat> okay, and it'll boot up to the normal uh, Windows desktop. So to start the software, uh, there's an icon on the desktop labeled awa.exe shortcut. Simply want to double click that. Now the screen obviously doubles as a touchscreen interface. You can also use the mouse and, uh, to select that icon. Initially, when the software boots up, it's going to ask us for, to open an existing database. And this will list the last four databases that have been opened. Since this is a new unit, it doesn't have any databases, we're going to go ahead and select Create New Database. And we just simply need to give it a name. And I'm just going to call it Dem Demo. And then hit Save. There we go. And it's going to automatically <clears throat> start with a default motor, but we're going to want to add a, a new motor. I'm going to add this motor that we're going to test here. I'm going to use the keyboard. I'm going to click the Add button. And now I'm going to enter a motor ID. Again, I'm just going to call this one Demo1. And then you would enter um, the nameplate information in this section down here. Now this is all just information, it's not required. The only required fields uh, to be filled out are the blue fields here. So basically a motor ID, and if you're interested in changing the location and building location, um, you can change those as well. So I'll just enter a few nameplate features, such as voltage rating, and this is a 460 volt motor. It's a half horsepower, put in 0.5. Um, and then I also want to put in the amp rating, which is 2 amps, and the, insula and the RPM, which is 3450. And that's the minimum amount of information that I want to enter. I'm going to click the Save button. And now it's going to ask me to select a test ID. And the test ID is going to define how the test is going to be performed. You never want to use the default test ID as it's in inefficient and it's not sufficient to properly test your winding. From the drop down, we have many options for various test IDs from IEC standards to um, common accepted industry practices. In this case, it's a, a 460 volt motor and we select the test ID based on the voltage of the bus. So 480 volt. This has a rotor installed and it's less than 101 horsepower. So I'm going to select this test ID that's named, named 480 volt with rotor, less than 101 horsepower, step. And the step defines it as the step voltage high pot. Click OK. And now I have my demo motor one selected. And now I'm ready to test. So I'll select the test <coughs> tab at the top. And from the test tab, we simply need to hit the run auto test button and then follow the directions on the screen. So I'm going to go ahead and select Run Auto Test. And my first instruction says Cancel. I can cancel the testing at this point if I like. Or attach the low voltage resistance leads only to the item under test. Now I'll need to use these <coughs> low voltage leads. And these are Calvin Bridge circuit. Go ahead and unravel them here. And we have a connector on this end, which connects into the connector in the bottom labeled with the R for resistance and it only goes in one way. I'm just screw it in to secure it. And then we take our test leads which are labeled 
uh, one, two, and three, and we'll co connect them to the motor test leads one, two, and three. Okay, you wanna make sure you make good connection on both sides of the clip. The Kelvin circuit relies on, on that to work properly. Now that our connections have been made, um, the next step is gonna to be to start the test by pressing the following buttons on the front panel to the right, the mega ohm and lead three buttons, which are located here and here. So simultaneously pressing those buttons will initiate the test. And that takes you to the resistance temperature screen. And it's waiting for us to enter, because the test ID was set up with temperature enabled, it's waiting for us to enter the temperature. So we take the temperature of the winding, which in this case is 70 degrees. You can see it's in degrees Fahrenheit here. And then hit accept. And then it will immediately begin to um, measure the resistance of the circuit from one to two first. And then it'll sequence to two to three, and then three to one. Each time it'll temperature correct. And then once we have all three readings, it'll calculate the individual coil contributors, and the resistances of each coil, and also calculate the, the delta R, which is, denotes the resistive imbalance in the circuit. So having um, a resistance imbalance of 0.64%, well below our threshold of 3%, the test will automatically proceed into the DC testing section. So it's gonna give us directions on what to do next. So we can cancel, if we wanna cancel for whatever reason. We can disconnect the low voltage resistance test leads, which I'll do now. And then we'll just set them aside. It's not necessary to disconnect the Amphenol connector at this time, although you can if you like. Step two is connect the high voltage test leads to the item under test. So now we wanna use our high voltage test leads, which come equipped with an additional black lead used for grounding. So we'll connect the ground lead to the motor frame. And then these are also labeled one, two, and three. So we'll connect them one to one, two to two, and three to three. And step three, press the OK button to continue or cancel button to abort. So we're going to OK, we're going to continue. And now as a safety measure, it's going to ensure we're ready to, com to commence testing, which will energize the high voltage leads and we'll see the high voltage leads light illuminate. Um, and we're going to initiate the testing in the same way we initiated the RLC testing by hitting the mega ohm and lead three. Okay, we see voltage ramping here, up to 500 volts. This is the mega portion of the testing. Um, on the right, we have the current measurement. The leakage current is measured back through the ground lead, basically, um, that auto scale. And then we see the timer ticking down from 60 seconds. We're now at 45 seconds and, and going towards zero. All right, now the mega testing is complete. We'll move on to the DA and PI section. Now this motor being less than 101 horsepower will only do a DA, which will go to three minutes. If it were a larger horsepower motor, we'd recommend doing a full polarization index test, which would uh, take an entire 10 minutes, a left time for the larger amount of insulation to completely polarize. So we can see our time remaining is only a minute and a half in this case which time this section of testing will be complete and we'll move into the, um, in this case, step voltage high pot test. All right, so now that uh, the DA is complete, we'll automatically proceed into the step voltage high pot test. And um, in the 
the window here you can see the uh, voltages being ramped in a step and then you can see our indicated leakage current here. If we want to see the levels we can simply click on this button labeled levels and that will show us the voltage level and the uh, leakage current. Not a whole lot to see at this very very low leakage current level though. And then as each step is complete, the voltage step, the le measured leakage current, and the calculated resistance will all be populated in this table as we go through each of the steps. Each step is going to hold for one minute, so for six, well, for five additional steps now, it's going to be an additional five-minute test plus ramp time. So as we ramp voltage, um, we can see that there's a spike in the red line, which indicates the, the current. So as we're ramping voltage, which we'll see here in, um, in the next step in just a second, the, and I'll change it over to levels so we can see it, the, charging, the, the current level goes up to a higher um, amount, what we call charging current, which is based on the, the rate of change of voltage. And then once voltage is held constant again, the current drops back down. And that's the current that we actually want to evaluate is the leakage current that's being uh, measured during the dwell portion of the step. So here we'll see, we'll ramp the voltage and you'll see the current level goes up. It's about 0.9 microamps based on that ramp rate. And then once we achieve the test voltage, it drops off. And now we're less than 0.01. It's almost immediately. This very small motor doesn't hold a lot of, of the charge. So it just that uh, the level of charging current is directly related to the amount of capacitance in the circuit. If you're testing through long cables, it'll have a higher charging current amount. And of course, if we increase the ramp rate, it'll also make that charging current value higher. But again, the, the current that we care about for step voltage testing is the comparison of final leakage currents um, at the end of each of the steps, which are, are recorded here in the table and then denoted on the graph by these tiny little uh, green triangles at the end of each of the steps. So there the uh, graph is rescaled to make way for more steps. But um, we got one more step to go and we are complete. This is the final step. Okay, and now that the DC testing is complete, uh, you saw the discharge indicators show up on there and now it's gonna move on uh, to surge testing. And it'll start by energizing uh, lead one, which we see testing lead one here. It's going to automatically scale the waveform for us and then automatically ramp to our test voltage, which in this case is 2000 volts again. And what we want to be mindful of is this pulse to pulse AR graph, that it's nice and flat, that we don't have any spikes. Uh, if a spike does occur, if it exceeds the dashed line, which is the threshold in this case of 5% pulse to pulse AR, the tester would automatically stop indicating a failure. But any spikes in this graph are not desirable and would indicate turn-to-turn -turn insulation weakness. Okay, now we're moving on to lead two. And see testing lead two. So now we're putting the pulse down lead two and lead one and lead three are the ground return paths. And the, you see the waveform ringing through the circuit. Again, we're being Mindful to see if there's any spikes in this pulse to pulse ER graph here in the lower right hand corner. So the pulse to pulse EAR, uh, EAR stands for error area ratio, which allows us to make a, a measurement of the difference between one pulse to the next pulse. And so there we see a little, there was a little bit of a spike in that, um, a little difference in the area of the winding which indicates there's insulation weakness um, in that particular, in that particular uh, phase.
Okay, and now that the testing is completed and it was run in an automatic mode, all the data is automatically saved to the database uh, under that demo one uh, motor. And we're, we're, we're completed with the testing. If we want to review the data, we can select the data tab, use the tabs along the bottom to look at the results summary. We can scroll to see the measure, uh, quanti quantified measurements of each of the tests that we conducted. Whether they passed or failed will be indicated by a green or a red uh, indication. Pass, fail. Uh, if we want to look at the graphs associated with each of the tests, we can go to the PI graph here, look at the DA, current and resistance versus time. We can go to the step voltage test. We can look at the voltage and current at each of the steps. And finally, we can look at the surge waves and the pulse to pulse EAR graph. And we can see how we had that one uh, spike on lead three there. Okay. If we wanted to generate a report, we can select the printer icon, select the current motor test result, or if you wanted to generate reports for all the motors that were tested in a certain date, date range or motors that tests that had passed or failed a specific test or all tests, um, you can select that. And then down here are the different types of report templates that are available. Summary, the surge nested pattern, the pulse to pulse ER graph that was shown. Um, all these things can be selected as well as the PI graph and the step voltage uh, graph. And then by default, it's RTF. There's other options for um, MHTML. If you run the software on your desktop you can and have Word installed, you can also do a Word report. Then you simply hit Create re Report. It's going to tell you how many results are going to be included in, the, in that report. In this case, since I selected the current motor test, then only one result will be included. And then it'll automatically generate the motor test report. Okay, I'm just going to make that a little bit larger. We can see, so you can see the nameplate information that I included, the result summary with all the quantified results. And then, depending on the template you selected, there's the DA graph, the table of measurements the step voltage graph and table and then the final um, surge results. So apparently I didn't select the surge waveforms, but you could have select those as well. Um, what I would do at this point is I would recommend you insert a memory stick and then save, uh, use the file save icon to save this to, um, to the memory stick. Save as and then select the memory stick and then save your results. Of course, you could save it on the local hard drive as well, but it will fill up over time.